Like wood. Oh, there. That works. Or is that too flat? Test, test. Speak up a little bit when you're doing it. Okay. Good evening. My name is Seth Dietrich. I am the rector, the head pastor of Christ Church Episcopal Whitefish Bay. Uh, we are so grateful to have you. I'm here to formally uh, welcome our panelists. Some of you have been here before. Some of you have uh, just stepped through our doors for the first time. I'm here to welcome uh, all of you who are physically present. And I know we have uh, 75 and counting uh, who are tuning into the live stream. Uh, so we're we're grateful for you. We know people have gathered from many different spiritual traditions, uh, wherever you've traveled from, uh, whatever tradition you are a part of or not a part of, uh, be at peace in this space. You are most welcome here. At Christ Church, we like to acknowledge that we are on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homeland along the southwest shores of Michigami, North America's largest system of freshwater lakes, where the Milwaukee the Menominee and the Kinnikinick Rivers meet, and the people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. We also acknowledge that our history in this parish runs deep in Whitefish Bay. So it means that our parish history is deeply intertwined with these structures uh, of racist oppression uh, that we're, uh, we'll hear more about uh, very soon. Um, this parish was founded in 1931, and it's very difficult to acknowledge the ways that our beloved founders may have had some of these racially restrictive covenants uh, uh, woven into the deeds of their properties. Uh, so in many ways, this is an appropriate place to uh, do a deep dive into the breadth and the depth uh, of, of history uh, in all of its uh, nitty gritty reality. And we are honored, we are honored to be a part of this ongoing project to, uh, to, to write another story, uh, to write a new story. Um, just a couple people that I want to acknowledge who are not here, um, who were a part of the beloved community team, the team within this parish that helped organize this event and has helped uh, do many uh, uh, other such events. Um, although nothing of this scale. Uh, bishop Ed Lydell, a bishop in the Episcopal Church, uh, founded the Beloved Community Team. Uh, bishop Ed uh, is now at home. I'm sure he's watching on the live stream. Uh, he has um, probably, he's uh, let go of the last treatments for cancer and he's uh, kind of opening his arms to that next step uh, in his spiritual journey, uh, looking to go home uh, in God's time. And then the other person I want to acknowledge is John Hayden. Uh, John Hayden uh, was really a driving force for so many of our programs around racial reconciliation and justice. Uh, and John passed away early this morning. Uh, and uh, it's a huge loss, uh, a huge loss for this parish. Uh, John was just about to move into phase two of his book tour, uh, promoting this book about uh, really a sort of a confessional about his own journey, uh, learning about his own privilege, uh, learning about systems uh, that he'd been a part of, and, and really laying out some ways that uh, we can all work for change. So I'm going to invite in a second uh, Father Oswald to open uh, us in prayer, and maybe we'll just take a few moments of silence to give thanks for John's life uh, among us. Uh, and I think jo Father Oswald will include that in the prayer, uh, and then you'll open us uh, with, with uh, a larger prayer. Thank you. 
So let us pray. God Almighty, we thank you for the life of our friend and companion, John Hayden. We are grateful for his relentless quest for peace and justice for all. We are inspired by his zeal and energy for a better world for all of God's children. Receive him in your kingdom where you have prepared a place for him. Comfort us who mourn and grant us grace to continue the work he has committed to. We also pray to God that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease. That our division being healed, we may live in justice and peace. Look with pity, O Heavenly Father, upon the people in this land who live with injustice, terror, disease, and death as their constant companions. Help us to eliminate our cruelty to these, our neighbors. Strengthen those who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equal opportunities for all. And grant that every one of us may enjoy a fair portion of the riches of this land. Enable us to eliminate poverty, prejudice, and oppression. That peace may prevail with righteousness and justice with order. And that men and women from different cultures and with differing talents and may find with one another the fulfillment of their humanity. We ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father Oswald. Thank you, Father Seth. Um, thank you to the beloved community team in Christ Church Episcopal, and especially Greg Bell, who was part of our planning um, committee for this event. I'm Ann O'Connor, along with Jen Coop Olsta and Kathy Werzer. I'm a co-founder of Bay Bridge. We came together in 2019 to work towards making Whitefish Bay a more welcoming community for all. So it's nice to be uh, back in this space. One of our very first events was here at Christ Church working with um, Bishop Lydell and the beloved community team on a screening of Radio Milwaukee's Invisible Lines. I'm sure some of you are here probably for that event. Uh, it's also nice to be here in April. This was a very intentional time for scheduling this um, project because of the fair housing legislation. Um, that was passed in April both federally and locally, locally um, with the work of Val Phillips and her um, ultimate success with the Milwaukee Common Council. And speaking of legislatures, we would like to um, acknowledge the lawmakers in our presence tonight. Law will be a big theme of the presentation. Um, so later in the program tonight, you will hear from Chairwoman, uh, Chairwoman Marcelian Nicholson. Thank you for being here. Um, I believe Supervisor Felicia Martin is here as well, if you want to raise your hand. I had the pleasure of meeting you very briefly last night at the County Parks Equity presentation at Villa Terrace. Good to see you. Um, I believe that uh, Supervisor Sheldon Wasserman is online, and I think Supervisor um, Sumner is as well. Uh, we also have Justice Dallet, if you want to raise your hand. Thank you for being here. Uh, State Representative Devin Draca, thank you for being here. Uh, Whitefish Bay Village President Kevin Buckley, hello. Uh, and if I'm missing any lawmakers who are present, would you like to acknowledge yourself? Sorry, I don't recognize everybody. Yes. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And any online lawmakers, are we able to find them? Greg, yes. Okay. Thank you, Greg. We can jump back in with that. 
Um, so thank you everybody for being here both online and in person. We have two of our event planners online that I'd like to acknowledge, Gailey and Larry Gallipol. So um, they will be helping people online as well. Um, and thank you to everyone. We have people representing multiple organizations here. And because I'm hoping that this is just the first of many conversations and that we're building a community around these discussions, I would like to take the time to mention all of our various sponsors that ha have come on board. So I think um, many of us are affiliated with one, if not more, of these organizations. So tonight we have people here from the Redress Movement, the Jewish Community Relations Council, Takun Hayir, Metropolitan Milwaukee Fair Housing Council, Five Points Neighborhood Association, Congregation Shalom, United Methodist Church Whitefish Bay, From the Same Dust, a Baha'i group, Congregation Sinai, TOSA Together, El Safi Real Estate Team, Greater Milwaukee Association of Realtors, Break the Silence in the Burbs, Rid Racism Milwaukee, MICA, the Episcopal Diocese of Milwaukee, 88.9 Radio Milwaukee, Bridge the Divide, Hummingbird, Divided by Design, and of course, Christchurch and Bay Bridge. So I think it's a pretty impressive list of organizations that have come together on this. Now I would like to introduce our panel. Ann Bonds is Associate Professor and Associate Chair of Geography and an affiliate faculty of the Urban Studies Program at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She is a critical human geographer whose research interests include race, racialization and racial segregation, urban political economy and community development, and housing studies. Derek Hanley is an assistant professor in the Department of English, also at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Professor Hanley's work deals with rhetorical strategies of civil rights and segregation protests, the arguments that drove African-American resistance in the urban north. He is currently completing a book that examines ur urban renewal policies from the 1950s in Pittsburgh, Milwaukee, and St. Paul, and rhetorical strategies in response to the demolition that occurred during the urban renewal period and also in the northern civil rights struggles over, over housing. Lawrence Hoffman is a broadly trained geographer and GIS professional interested in working on socially conscious projects that reconsider the logic and power dynamics of spatial production. A GIS program manager for Groundwork Milwaukee, he oversees projects that collect, analyze, and publish geographic data in ways that augment groundwork projects, focusing specifically on putting the power of maps in the hands of residents who can use them to advocate for resources. And Reggie Jackson has presented numerous times in Whitefish Bay here at Christ Church, United Methodist Church, in front of our Whitefish Bay School Board. Um, my co-founder, Kathy Werzer, has had the um, pleasure of facilitating with Mr. Jackson for years. He is a much sought after speaker, researcher, and writer for over a decade, regionally and nationally. His work helps institutions and individuals understand how our country's racial hierarchy developed historically, its impact on our lives today, and how we can realize America's promise for all citizens. So thank you all for being here. Good evening, everybody. It is really wonderful to be here. Thank you all for coming. We're just very excited to be able to share more about our research with you here on Fair Housing Month. Our project is called Mapping research, Racism and Resistance in Milwaukee County, and our project is the first effort to comprehensively map and document all restrictive racial covenants in Milwaukee County. But our project is not just about documenting these covenants. We are also looking to document and uncover black resistance to discriminatory housing policies in the early part of the 20th century. So before we get started with this, I just want to thank all of the organizers, all the work that went into producing this event. We want to especially thank Greg Bell, Ann O'Connor, and Kathy Werzer, who have been 
wonderful in communicating with us. As, um, I'm missing another person, I'm sorry. Eva as well, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm probably, there's countless others I'm missing. We know how much work it takes to put an event like this together and we are so grateful for all of the people who worked so hard to make this night happen. This project has been several years in the making and we wanna recognize some of the important partnerships and collaboration of, of a lot of people who aren't up here on the panel with us this evening but who have been a critical part um, of the project. So our presentation today is supported by the research and efforts of Dr. Joseph Walzer. Joe's in the back, Joe, if you don't mind waving, waving your hand, as well as by Kat Kosiski and Madison Williams. Our project is supported by a UWM Discovery and Innovation Grant. And finally, and really importantly, um, we want to recognize our, collaboration, our collaborators from the Mapping Prejudice Project at the University of Minnesota. Um, and we thank them for all of their support and for sharing their expertise. Um, they've been an essential part of getting this project off the ground. Um, Lawrence and Reggie and I, we were realizing we've been talking about this project since 2017. So that gives you a sense of how long we've been really trying to work to get this off the ground and, and also why we're so thrilled that we can be here today and now be sharing our work with a wider audience. Restrictive covenants are legally enforceable agreements limiting how owners and renters can use a property. And they're listed in real estate deeds or contracts. So covenants themselves can apply to a range of details from the appearance of a house, for example, limitations on building heights, to constraints on the kinds of activities that can take place on a property. So for example, raising livestock would be prohibited. However, racially restrictive covenants were clauses that specifically prohibited non-white people from purchasing, leasing, or occupying certain properties. And in the first half of the 20th century, racial covenants were used throughout the United States, especially in cities for segregation, segregationist purposes. They began first appearing in deeds with, with more frequency at the turn of the century. Um, and they especially uh, became more frequent following the 1917 Supreme Court decision in the case of Buchanan versus Worley, which outlawed municipal racial zoning, which was essentially, these were city ordinances that designated where black people could live. So then following this 1917 decision, racial covenants became increasingly commonplace withstanding numerous court challenges throughout the 1920s and 1930s. And the covenants that we share on the slide today, um, these were detected and identified in our proof of concept study, which Lawrence will talk about um, shortly. So these are covenants that until uh, we, we commenced this product, project had not been documented. So by 1928, half of over half of all homes owned by white people in the United States were covenanted. Though racial covenants often included language identifying a range of racial, ethnic, and religious groups prohibited from occupying properties, in practice, they specifically targeted black Americans, especially as black Americans were moving to cities in the Northeast, the Midwest, and the West during the first, second, and late Great Migration in search of new opportunities and to escape the oppressive conditions of Jim Crow. Here we can see a covenant from South Milwaukee, um, noting that the premise shall not be occupied, quote, by others than the white race and by American citizens, end quote. So this is at the very bottom, I know it's hard to read. But this is a notable inclusion. Um, in 1924, Milwaukee's immigrant population was the largest in the nation surpassing cities even like Chicago and New York. So now we can see how citizenship becomes um, embedded within these covenants as well. Just as the Great Migration was underway, developers and the burgeoning real estate industry advanced the idea that residential property values were tied to the racial homogeneity of neighborhoods. They associated highly segregated white neighborhoods with high property values and associated the presence of non-white people with property value decline. In fact, in 1924, the National Association of Real Estate Boards 
introduced Article 34 into its code of ethics, which stipulated that, quote, a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy, members of any race or nationality, or individuals whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values. So what this tells us is that years before the Homeowners Loan Corporation created residential security maps, like we see here up on our screen, um, that the, and before this, the, these maps really systematized the practice of redlining in cities, racial covenants had already been in place for years, and they had already established patterns of racial segregation in cities. In fact, those residential security maps, or the redlining maps, were actually designed around the urban racial boundaries and, that had already been established, and higher ratings on these maps were assigned to neighborhoods and communities uh, that already had racial covenants in place. So during this period of time, growing suburban communities and new subdivisions were promoted as exclusive and highly restricted. And of course, this is, was meant to communicate um, the premium of whiteness and property values and the, the kinds of housing quality that could be associated with these spaces. And so here we see an image from 1938. This is at um, the Whitefish Bay Health Office. And we see the sign hanging above that says, that, uh, advertising the city as, quote, highly a highly restricted residential North, so North Shore suburb. So at this point in time with our research, what we know thus far is that um, the, first register, or the first racial covenant registered in Milwaukee County um, was in 1919, and it racially restricted the Washington Highlands housing development in Wauwatosa. And of course, Washington Highlands was not alone. During the 1920s, 29 other subdivisions in just Wauwatosa um, registered deed covenants. And this included residential developments like the Beverly Hills area, Rogers Park, Westgate, Blue Mound Manor, um, and there's many others. And racial restrictive covenants were implemented throughout Milwaukee County in the 1920s and the 1930s. And really this followed um, new developments. As new developments were being built, um, they were implemented throughout the county. And there were racial covenants within the city of Milwaukee as well as well as in neighboring suburbs. So we said the first covenants are in the kind of inner ring suburbs, including Whitefish Bay, Shorewood, Cudahy, West Allis, West Milwaukee. And this trend continued um, into the 40s and even the 1950s with new suburban developments in Bayside, sorry, I needed to advance my slides, Bayside, Greendale, Greenfield, Glendale, and Fox Point. So we can look into a specific example here in Whitefish Bay. Um, this map is, we always get a chuckle out of this map because it's called the phenomenal suburban ex expansion in illustrated map form. It's also an interesting map um, because here you see, we're used to seeing kind of a north-south orientation and here we're looking in the city uh, to the west and to see kind of the expansion of the city um, in, in, around the urban core. Um, so if we look in the screen, and I've, I've got this highlighted right here, um, we can uh, turn to a subdivision called Zingen and Bronze Strathmore. And you can't really see it, but I've highlighted the location of that on the screen. Um, this, uh, this subdivision was covenanted in 1927 with the racial covenant set to expire in 1975. And so here we can see that on the map, and then we can also take a look here. Um, this is an advertisement that appeared in the Milwaukee uh, Sentinel, um, and uh, here we see that Strathmore, as a residential development, is being advertised to potential white buyers as, quote, a highly distinctive and restricted district. Of course, this is just one example of so many. Um, I'll put up a slide here that has a few other local examples in the area. Um, so these were so commonplace that by the 1940s, local NAACP attorney George Brawley found that approximately 90% of the subdivisions that had been platted in the city of Milwaukee since 1910 contained some kind of re restrictive covenant. 
Even after the Supreme Court ruled that racial covenants were not enforceable in the 1948 Supreme Court case of Shelley versus Kramer, racial covenants continued to be filed in Milwaukee County. The last racial deed covenant filed in Wauwatosa, for example, was registered in 1955, so a full seven years after Shelley versus Kramer. And um, a covenant was registered three years later, a full decade after Shelley versus Kramer, in, in Glen, excuse me, Greendale for the Crestview Acres subdivision. So clearly, even after uh, covenants were no longer legally enforceable, the symbolic, their symbolic power remained, communicating the message that these neighborhoods were for whites only. Though restrictive deed covenants are widely recognized and studied, few comprehensive accounts of their spatial and temporal patterning exist because they are embedded in county deed records. It's an enormous volume of data, um, a lot of documents to examine. And so we're working with mapping the Mapping Prejudice Project and utilizing their methods, which Lawrence will talk about in more detail, um, to process these deeds faster. And so to give you a, a sense of the size of the, the data set that we're working with, uh, we have 1.7 million deed images. So for all of the property records between 1910 and 1960. Um, and so we know that we have about 650,000 property deeds that we can process and work through. And we've done a proof of concept, again, that Lawrence will talk about, and we estimate discovering around 20,000 racial covenants. So this is a huge project that no one researcher or no one group could do alone. And it's for these reasons that we talk about this project as being a collaborative project. Because even after we've identified these, these deeds or the restrictive deed covenants, they need to be verified by at least five people so that we can confirm the validity of our data set. So community participation is essential to the project. And as we speak, the property records are being processed. Um, we anticipate that we'll begin commencing our community workshops to actually transcribe and verify these deeds in the summer and the fall. So you'll be hearing a lot more from us. Um, we've included sign-up shoots on the side of the, the, this table over here if people are interested in participating in these events. Um, and at this point, um, I'd like to just say the other thing that we're interested as we move into the next phase of this project is learning more from Milwaukee County residents about their own stories and experiences. Do you have stories and experiences about racial segregation or discrimination in housing that you'd like to share? Um, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Derek Handley. Thank you, Ann. Can you all hear me okay? All right, good evening, everyone. I'm a little nervous. This is my first time speaking in a church. It's, uh, I'm going to resist the urge to preach a little bit. As Ann noted, racial covenants were just one mechanism explicitly designed to separate urban populations by race. They worked in conjunction with other federal policies, municipal ordinances, and private practices that ensure the racial segregation of American cities. At the local scale, municipalities and private actors back real estate practices and patterns of lending that further guaranteed the racial uniformity of neighborhoods. Opposition to integration on the part of white homeowners together with federal and local policies strengthened urban racial boundaries, intensified post-war housing crisis in cities across the U.S. Housing across the U U.S. Housing shortages for growing black po populations in the urban north were particularly acute due, the, due to the, quote, double barrier, which is deteriorating and limiting housing stock combined with entrenched racism that prevented access to affordable, decent housing, and that intensified overcrowding. Landlords in Milwaukee and elsewhere exploited these conditions through rent increase 
Rent increases targeting black renters who had few other options for housing. So these interlocking systems of racism in housing were well known to Milwaukee civil rights leaders and the general African American population. In 1926, a Milwaukee Urban League reported, reported identified housing as one of the greatest problems confronting Milwaukee's black residents, documenting that 99% of the city's black residents were renters and had faced rent increases of 30 to 200%. And as, Nan, as Ann noted, in the early 1940s, NAACP attorney George Brawley made a survey of the plats filed, filed with the Register of the Deeds, finding that 90% of the subdivisions which have been platted in the city of Milwaukee since 1910 contain some type of restrictive covenant. So the point I'm trying to make here is black people have known, have already known about these covenants and we're working against them. So of course, Milwaukee, black Milwaukee resisted this housing segregation. For example, in the 1940s, there was a group of NAACP activists that acquired lots outside of the sixth ward in, quote, Carlton's addition on the city's expanding northwest side. The Halyards, oh, I'm not hitting my slide, so let me give me some, there we go. The Halyards formed uh, the Columbia Savings and Loan to help families purchase homes where, who were otherwise excluded from the housing market. And um, this is a picture of Artie Clark Halyard, who was one of the founders of Columbia Savings and Loans with her husband. So these resistance efforts by, um, by black Milwaukeeans predate what is commonly understood as the civil rights period in Milwaukee, thinking about the 1960s and the housing marches. So these are just a few examples of resistance to restrictive covenants and legal housing segregation. So, so far in our research, um, we have placed these resistance tactics into three categories. Um, one, academics, we like to have points of three, right? <laughs> so one, engaging in public discourse, writing and speaking publicly against segregation practice. Uh, Milwaukee has a proud tradition of um, black newspapers where often some of these arguments were being made. Two, community organizing, which include the formation of local organizations and institutions in response to the housing crisis, as well as the cooperative efforts of local chapters of national organizations such as the NAACP and the Urban League. And three, land property acquisitions <clears throat> to provide housing for African Americans. And this also includes individual attempts to circumvent covenants. And one person I would like to highlight in particular is Zeddy Heiler, um, who directly confronted covenants. In 1944, Heiler left New Albany, Mississippi as part of the great migration of African Americans traveling for better opportunities in the urban north. In Isabel Wilkerson's brilliant book, The Warmth of Other Sons, which tells of the story of the Great Migrations, one of the persons in the book described Milwaukee with its concrete smokestacks, clanking trolley cars, and factory silos as, quote, the other side of the world from the wide open, quiet land of the cotton fields, end quote. This was the strange new land in which Hyler and other African Americans arrived in the 1940s. Once in Milwaukee, Hyler worked at a grocery store. He also worked at Alice Chalmers and other industrial jobs, and then got a job as a United States postal clerk. He occasionally helped two jobs at a time, as he said, to quote, help us get ahead. He eventually bought and lived in a three unit building at 25. 43 9th Street in the heart of Bronzeville. In 1955, after a decade of living and working in Milwaukee, he decided that he wanted to build a house in Wauwatosa for his family, which included his wife Mary, his son Alan, and his mother Nancy. But in order to do that, to subvert the restrictive housing covenants, Hyler asked his white friend to buy the property and then sell it to him. As a result, 
Zyler was able to build and become the first black person to buy property in Wauwatosa. He submitted his permit to build on his lot at 2363 North 113th Street. Recalling this time in an interview given over 30 years later, Heiler said, quote, I went right to City Hall and applied for all of the permits in person so they wouldn't have to guess who was coming to dinner. <laughs> End quote. According to a Milwaukee newspaper report, shortly after construction began on his house, extensive damage was inflicted on his property and he received numerous threatening phone calls telling him to, quote, stay where you belong, end quote. But none of this deterred Heiler. Heiler built his house in 1955 and remained there until his death in 2004. Despite the racialized borders created by the covenants, Heiler's determination to buy land and build a house for his family in a restricted suburban neighborhood is just one of the many examples of social, political, and rhetorical acts a resistance. Heiler's story may not be new to many of you. There's a historical marker outside of the residence where members of his family still live. But we now know that, that by 1958, just three years after Heiler moved in, there were two other African American families living within two blocks of Heiler, according to a 1958 Milwaukee NAACP Housing Committee report. What was those families' experience? How did they overcome the covenants? Does something similar happen in other neighborhoods? These are some of the stories we hope to hear about and to depict visually through mapping. Because to tell the whole, to tell the whole story of restricted housing covenants, we must also depict visually black agency. And what I mean by that is to depict how African American individuals and organizations in Milwaukee were active agents against restrictive housing from when the documents first appeared. So, to, so together with the help of community researchers, Milwaukee County residents, college and high school students, and our community partners, we will be able to provide an interactive digital resource that will be accessible to the community, policymakers, and other researchers. But why is this project necessary? Why do we know, need to know any of this now? To paraphrase my friend, Dr. Rob Smith of Marquette University, our project is needed because the past changes. The more we learn about the past, the more we have a better understanding of what happened then, but also where we are in the present and where we, and where we are headed in the future. Hopefully the mapping racism and resistance in Milwaukee County project will as assist in that endeavor. So to say more about why knowing the history and locations of racial covenants is important to us today and important for Milwaukee's future is my friend, Mr. Reggie Jackson. I'm trying to steal your microphone. Uh, wow, it's, it's great to be here with you all. Thank you all for coming out. Um, you know, I think this is maybe my third time presenting here. I always love to be in familiar spaces with familiar faces. A lot of people I know in this audience. So I'm really so excited to be a part of, of this illustrious group. Uh, many of you have heard me do my presentation. I call it Hidden Impact of Segregation. Uh, and so I want to just share with you why I do that uh, and why it's important. Um, and then how people continually want me to do it. I've actually done that presentation over the last two weeks. I've done it three different times. And I'll talk to you about how many other times I've done it. So this building that's on the picture is a building that used to be right on the corner, uh, nearly right on the corner, 27th and Burleigh in Milwaukee. And the reason that, that, that I have that picture is my mother's uncle used to live right down the street from this building. There used to be a little bar there where it says kind of the cool spot, there was a little bar there that my mother's uncle used to go to, and you know, he cashes social security check. Remember when you could cash your check at the bar back in the day, right? Remember that? And he would go there, and he, I mean, he always had fun stories about his friends and how he interacted with people. And every time I drove past that building, I looked at how ugly it was. And I, I, I thought to myself, why is this ugly building standing? 
year after year after year. Why is it that people in this neighborhood have to walk past or drive past something that looks that ugly? And then I thought, on the flip side of the coin, there are not places that look like this in any white community in Metro Milwaukee. There's not a single building that white people have to drive by or walk by that looks like this. And, and as bad as that building looked, they finally demolished it last summer. I first took a picture of it. This is the second picture I took of it. The first time I took a picture of it was in 2016, and they finally tore it down last summer. But it's, it's what that building means to me is a continuation of not only discriminatory practices and policies related to housing, but what I see as even more important is an intentional disinvestment in black neighborhoods, intentional disinvestment. When, when you go to the area where this building is, it's one of the, the, the really most challenging neighborhoods in Milwaukee. Just a few blocks away from here is an area called the 30th Street Corridor, which were all of these small factories that supported the big factories in Milwaukee and employed thousands and thousands of black people. Uh, but once those factories went away, Nobody did anything about it. Nobody did anything about the job losses, the deterioration in the community. Nobody on the local level, state level, federal level cared. And so when I talk about the hidden impact of segregation, what I found when I started to research it is that it's much deeper than I thought it was, right? I thought that it was just about redlining, racial covenants, but when I started to look at it in depth here in Milwaukee specifically, I discovered that it's a lot more than that. There are all of these other pieces that fit into the puzzle of creating the Milwaukee we see today. My family moved here in 1973 from a little town in Mississippi, a segregated town in Mississippi, Charleston, Mississippi. Um, we had separate swimming pools for black and white kids in that town. And up until the year before COVID hit, they were still having separate high school proms in my hometown in Mississippi. But this is the crazy part. In 1970, 16 years after Brown versus Board of Education, a federal judge told Mississippi, integrate your school. So I actually had white classmates in second grade in Mississippi, came to walk in third grade, didn't have a white classmate until ninth grade. So from third through eighth grade, I didn't have a single white classmate. I didn't know why. I didn't know that it was about segregation. I didn't think that I lived in a segregated neighborhood in the heart of the 53206 zip code, which was at that time a beautiful place to live. But as I grew to understand the policies and practices that created these segregated spaces, I understood why my neighborhood looked different, why my schools looked different. And so in 2015, a reporter from CNN reached out to me, Ray Sanchez, great guy. And he says, Reggie, I'm, I'm working on a piece about segregation. And, you know, we always call somebody in Milwaukee when we're working on segregation, right? Because you guys are the poster child. I'm like, yeah, I know. We, we don't like to hear it, but, yeah, we know. And so uh, we talked for about two and a half hours. I invited him to come to Milwaukee. He came, and I gave him what I call my segregation tour. My segregation tour is very quick and simple. Go down to the lakefront, North Avenue, drive from North Avenue through the city all the way to Brookfield and just look at the changes that you see along the way. And that tells you what segregation policies and practices have meant. And so after he wrote that article on CNN's website and then was on CNN Student News, some of the students in the school I worked in were like, Mr. Jackson, you're on the news, you're on the news. I'm like, and then literally everybody and their grandmother started calling me like, Reggie, uh, can you talk to us about segregation? Milwaukee Magazine reached out, said, Reggie, can you write a feature length article about segregation in Milwaukee? I'm like, sure. I spent three months researching, writing, submitted it. They were like, this is wonderful, we love it. They never published it. Um, I learned a valuable lesson. 50% up front, moving forward. <laughs> so what that led to was, in my mind, I said, well, let me just take what I've learned and share it with people. So I started to do this presentation called The Hidden Impact of Segregation. And these are just some of the places that I've done it at. Uh, the list, I stopped counting when I got to about 100. But I know I've done it at least probably 100 times since then. So I've done this presentation, some version of it, probably 200 times. And I'm amazed that I've done it that many times because I'm amazed how interested people are in this particular topic. So what I try to do with my presentation, I say that if you do, you know, these big puzzles, right, a thousand word puzzle, you know, you dump the puzzle pieces out on a big table and you start working away at it, right? But imagine, if somebody came and took that puzzle box cover away from you, how much harder it would be to put the puzzle together. I think that's part of what we're trying to do. We're trying to give you that cover back 
to show you how Milwaukee became what it is today. And this project is going to be really critically instrumental in helping us to understand within the city where those covenants were. We kind of know where they were in the suburbs, but to see where they were in the city, I think it's going to be an incredible, incredible just addition to our local history. And I'm really excited about the project. I'm also excited about a new organization I'm a part of that is one of the sponsors tonight, The Redress Movement. It's a national organization that came out of the work of Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law. Uh, the, the movement has been launched in Charlotte, Denver, and Milwaukee. I'm part of the research team for Redress. If you want to learn more about it, uh, redressmovement.org. Um, and, and we're going to be looking to really work with communities in Milwaukee to kind of redress some of the damage caused by segregation. So uh, our last panel member is, is my good friend Lawrence Hoffman. Now, I met Lawrence uh, at UWM when the professors from Mapping Prejudice was there giving a lecture. Uh, and Lawrence and I went up and we talked to him and we met and we we're like, you know, we, we need to have, have some more conversations. And that led to us developing a relationship and eventually leading to being a part of this group. So I'm excited about what he's going to share with you, the process we're going to go through. So I'm going to tell the joke I told last time. It's an honor, a privilege, and a challenge to follow Reggie in a, in a talk. Um, but here we go. Uh, so my name is Lawrence Hoffman. I'm the director of GIS at Groundwork Milwaukee. Uh, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems for the uninitiated. Uh, basically, what I do is I work with spatial data. I make maps using computers, right? So big nerd. I'm the nerd on the team, in case you can't tell just by looking at me. Um, so uh, my role here is to talk about the maps, right? Um, I, I, actually, to give you a little context, let me tell you where I work so you understand kind of how I got here. I work for Groundwork Milwaukee. We're a conservation-based uh, land trust. We focus on issues of environmental justice. Um, our main emphasis is building the capacity of residents to activate vacant green space. So if you go out in Milwaukee, and this is part of what Reggie was talking about, lack of investment in black communities, in the landscape. Uh, there are thousands of vacant lots, res formerly residential vacant lots. Uh, we work with residents who have a desire and a vision to create those vacant lots and turn them into, into assets. So community gardens, parks, what have you. Uh, we also provide green infrastructure training and education to youth. Um, and job opportunities as well along those lines. So our work, oh, louder, louder for the people at home. Maybe I better hold this like Reggie. Is that better? I have to talk to my neck. <laughs> All right. Um, so our work is inherently spatial, right? Uh, so we use maps to tell our story and to keep track of what we do. Uh, Groundwork is also part of a broader network of land trusts all over the country, uh, Groundwork USA network, and I provide GIS support to cities all over the country through that network. And one of our biggest initiatives is called the Climate Safe, uh, Climate Safe Neighborhoods Initiative. Uh, and so basically I make maps, and I make maps that tell the history of residential segregation and put that into the context of contemporary exposure to extreme heat and flooding. So basically, I make maps, I give them to residents who then go advocate for climate resilience resources in their neighborhoods that have been historically underfunded and under-resourced. Um, and we found that this uh, has a surprising impact and, and really opens doors for people. I'll talk a little more about that later. Now back to what we're actually here to talk about. So. Um, I'm the map guy. Uh, I'm here to talk about basically why, why do we need to make this map, right? So we have all these intelligent people sitting right here that could tell you all about covenants. Um, we know that this is a real and true history. We know that this happened. Why do we need to put it on the map? Uh, and there are a number of different reasons. One of them is that the visualization is important. That's actually the tagline of our colleagues' uh, project at the uh, University of Minnesota Libraries. 
visualizing the hidden histories of race and privilege in the built environment, right? Visualizing is actually important because it gives you a sense of the extent, it gives you the sense of the spatial distribution, and you can start to get extremely specific about understanding that history, uh, the cover of the puzzle, as Reggie was saying. Um, so that's one reason why we need to make this map. Uh, the other thing it does is it provides a really powerful public tool that denies the myth of de facto segregation, and that's, of course, taken from Richard Rothstein's book, um, but this sort of notion that people self-segregated. Uh, so this tool emphatically denies that. It's a public resource, and it's also made by the public, right? So people have invested their own time and energy in building this resource. Um, another reason the map is really powerful is because it creates, when you look at the map, you can actually look and see where your house is or you can look and see where your parents' house was, or at least the neighborhood you grew up in. So it creates this incredibly personal tie to the history. Once you see in your own deed, in the house that you live in, or that your family has lived in for ages, right, that you see it, that you've benefited from this practice, you have to face that history. And you can choose to either say, it wasn't my idea, I don't care, or you can choose to try to think about how you could go forward. Uh, you can think about redress, right? Um, so that's the challenge of the personal tie, and that comes specifically from the map, because you can actually look right at your house and think about what it means that your neighborhood was uh, really into these housing covenants. Uh, another reason to make the map is that maps are really powerful, right? So they. What they do is they have this power to present us, there's something sort of self-evident, right? They can tell an extremely complex history in an instant, uh, just by looking at it. Something that would take pages and pages and pages to, to write a textbook about. You can tell that story in an instant, but first you have to do the really hard work, right? Um, so that's what, that's what we're here to, to hopefully inspire you all to be involved in, because as the project moves forward, um, it's going to involve volunteer engagement, it's gonna involve all of us to participate. And let me tell you why that is. So, uh, Anne gave you some numbers around, what is it, 1.7 million documents that we're processing. Um, and I haven't advanced my slides at all here, have I? <laughs> That's an image from our colleague's website at uh, Mapping Prejudice, University of uh, Minnesota Libraries. Uh, that's Climate Safe Neighborhoods. Um, but let me just talk about this process real quick. So um, basically, it's a four-step process. To even begin, you have to be lucky enough that the Register of Deeds in your area has digitized all of the deeds. And we are lucky enough to be in that situation here in Milwaukee. Uh, we started the process back in 20, I think it was spring of 2018. I started going to the Register of Deeds and sort of pulling that thread. And we finally, after many, many discussions and even a little bit of controversy, landed all of the deeds um, how long ago, Ann? March. Just this March, right? So we've been working on getting our hands on the deeds for that long of time. Um, but that's the first step. Once you have them, then uh, basically, let me take a step back. I forgot to mention, and this is very important, I did not design this process. I am here to relay the technical components that our friends at the University of Minnesota Library uh, they built all this software, they came up with these methods, and they're sharing them with us. Um, as the uh, nerd of the group here, I'm the one to sort of tell you how it works. Um, but I, I want to be very clear that I did not come up with this myself. Um, all right, so the first step, once you have your digitized deeds, um, is to process them all using something called OCR, or optical character recognition. Uh, so basically, if you're familiar with the difference between a PDF, which is basically a snapshot or a digital picture of, an, of a document, 
The difference between that and a Word document is that you can't actually read, the computer cannot read that text. So unless you have something called optical character recognition. So optical character recognition can read the text from an image. So the software is written to then flag any racial language and pull it out. Uh, so every single of the 1.7 million documents will be run through this software that can read images and flag specific words. Uh, and the list of words is based on the ones that were successful in Hennepin County and Minnesota. Uh, but basically, we're talking about any type of racial language. Uh, and they built that list based off uh, sampling various uh, race-based covenants that they actually found and drew out of their sample. Uh, so once you've run it through the OCR, the OCR flags it, but computers, they're not always that smart, right? They're only as smart as the people who build them and the people who are using them. So optical character recognition can make mistakes. So of all of these documents that we're scanning and flagging, they all have to be verified by real people. And not only one person, we're going to need five people to verify that this is actually a race-based housing covenant. And that's where all of you will come in. Once all of the flag deeds have been set aside from the optical character recognition process, they'll be uploaded to an online platform called Zooniverse, where the public then engages in that verification process. And this is part of what's so powerful about this whole project is that we couldn't do it ourselves even if we wanted to, unless we wanted to spend a few lifetimes on it, right? So we actually need help from everyone else. The public has to be engaged in this issue, and the public has to contribute. And by that contribution, then, they're more invested in the outcome. Um, they're more informed and they care more, hopefully. That's the, that's the idea, right? Um, so then the next step, once everything, the deeds have been verified and set aside, in order to put them on the map, we have to be able to tie them to the actual residential plot boundaries, right? And the thing about property boundaries is that they sort of change and morph over time. Uh, so this, requires a pretty intense amount of work on the GIS front in terms of digitizing historical plot boundaries um, because that's essential to making the map. But it also allows for an opportunity for education and engagement across various GIS groups. Uh, we have some designs about potentially engaging high school youth uh, so that not only will they be uh, learning about this history, they'll be gaining a technical skill um, that you can have a career in at the end of it, right? Obviously, they won't be certified or anything, but it gets you started thinking about the fact that this is something that you could potentially do. Um, so there's another opportunity for engagement there. So we've actually, uh, actually our good friends at the University of Minnesota Library ran a proof of concept for us once we uh, had established our initial relationship with the Register of Deeds back in uh, this was in August of 2018. We ran a, a proof of concept through their optical character recognition process. Uh, it was five sample deeds per year from 1910 to 1960. Uh, that was 254 total deeds. Uh, there were 10 of them were flagged, so that's a 4% hit rate. And of the 10 that were flagged, five of them were actually verified to have races uh, housing covenants in them. So that's uh, a, basically 2% of the deeds that were run. Um, and so based on the numbers that we talked about before, and Anne mentions this, we would estimate that there'd be between 20, 000, uh, 20 and 25,000 uh, deeds that we will discover and then subsequently have to put on a map. Um, so that's the project that we hope that, you know, this is actually happening now. I, sometimes when I was preparing for this, I kept forgetting that it's actually happening. We're not just talking about it anymore. So, so this is the point where uh, we want you all to stay engaged with us and, and keep following and checking back in because very soon there's going to be opportunities for you all to participate in helping us make this map. Uh, and that's what I have prepared for you all today.
Oh. Oh, man. One more thing. I totally forgot I had slides the whole time. How did that happen? Like, I've never done this before. All right. So th this is actually a slide that I prepared. These are some of the uh, deeds that were flagged in the proof of concept. So these are three of the five that were pulled out of that 254. Um, so you can actually see the examples and hopefully uh, read through some of these uh, the covenants to, to get a sense of what the language is and what we'd be looking for. One more slide. <laughs> <laughs> Hear me? Yes? Okay. I'm Kathy Worzer. I am um, part of Bay Bridge, and um, we're heading into the question and answer period. I have on a flimsy shirt that wasn't a good thing to wear. <laughs> Maybe I'll look it up. In Does that work? Okay. Perfect. All right. <laughs> um, so I'm Kathy Werzer, and I'm part of Bay Bridge. And um, we are heading into the question and answer period. And this is for people who are here in person, as well as people who are um, joining us virtually. I already have some questions up here from the virtual people. Um, and we have um, index cards. And so anyone who has a question, um, if you, have you already received index cards? Okay. So then just hold it up, and we do have people who will come around and collect your index cards and bring them up to me so that um, we can start the question and answer period. And then there are a couple of microphones. Maybe if you want to send one of those down between them. And I'll let the four of you decide who's going to answer the questions. Um, so my first introduction to racial covenants was actually from Reggie. Um, and I had um, somebody send me some racial covenants um, from Whitefish Bay, and the one was up in the slides that Anne put up in there. And I was sitting in my home reading them and realized that my home was in the Bay Ridge subdivision that was on one of those racial covenants. And so what that told me um, was that we as white people need to be doing something about this. And so this is a lovely project because um, we have an opportunity to participate and to um, do something about this. So I don't have any index cards up here yet, but um, as they come up, I'll go back and forth between the virtual and the in-person. Um, so we have Maddie Riordan who was wondering, how many of these communities actively acknowledge that these covenants existed, continue to exist, question mark, and do they use that acknowledgement as a place for conversation and education? I don't know if anybody here knows that. Well, um, I, I know that I, I've done this presentation in a variety of different communities around Metro Milwaukee and within Milwaukee County as well as some of the exurban counties as well. And uh, once people became aware of these covenants, they started to talk about them. Probably the, the, the most, um, I would say, most important instance of that is I did a presentation. The mayor of South Milwaukee was there. And that particular covenant that I shared is the most extreme example we found. It was written in December of 1937. It wasn't set to expire until January 1st, 
2024. And so the mayor of South Milwaukee was like, he came up to me after the presentation. He said, I didn't, I didn't know anything about this, Reggie. What can we do about it? I'm like, Mr. Mayor, you know, just use it as a teachable moment to show why South Milwaukee is as white as it is right now. Use it as a teachable moment. It, that wasn't going to work with him. He sweated me for two straight years. Reggie, what can we do about it? How can we get rid of it? And he eventually got the city attorney's office working on it. And they went to that subdivision and asked residents to sign an amendment to that covenant to basically, you know, amend the language and, and take that language out. And I know when I did um, a presentation in Tulsa, um, I used a sign that used to be in Tulsa that said, you know, restrictive zoning. And so there a lot of conversations happen there. I think most of the places I've done it at, people who didn't know that they were there started to look to see if they were there. They looked at the report that was done by Lois Quinn's group uh, that showed that 16 of the 18 suburbs with the Milwaukee County use them. Uh, River Hills and Oak Creek were the only exception. So people know that they're there. And I don't know if people are necessarily doing something about it, but they're talking about it in a way that they, they weren't before. And people have, have reached out to me and said, Reggie, you know, I, I found a covenant in, in the attic of my grandmother's house. So people are finding them and they're sharing them. And I know that uh, people have shared some with Ann uh, and her group as well. So people, when they become aware, they start to talk about them. I don't know if that's acknowledging them. I guess it's acknowledging them. Like, yeah, here it is. I found it in my attic. So, yeah, they're acknowledging them. And, and that's a good thing, that people are acknowledging that they exist. Just to add just a little bit, um, and I have to say hi to Maddie because Maddie was a student in one of my classes many moons ago, so it's nice to hear her name in this context. Um, but yeah, what we're finding is that there's a deep interest in these. Um, and one of the things is uh, people have the kinds of experiences that Kathy just mentioned a moment ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very powerful process. It's, it's the, we always say that the power of this project is actually the process itself, um, although the maps will be wonderful and incredibly useful and producing a data set on all of the covenants will be valuable for all kinds of research and policy making um, and also just for community groups. But it's also extremely powerful when individuals themselves find out that the homes where they live or the communities where they grew up in were covenanted communities. And I think as, as Lawrence was saying that this, this personal connection to these wider processes um, is something that we found is very powerful for people and it is a motivator to get involved. Um, so I think there's lots of interest. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I don't know about the acknowledgement, but at the same time, people really are just starting to find out about these and becoming uh, very engaged. Thank you. So we have a question. If I participate in the project, give me an idea of what I would be doing to help. Okay, so we will be hosting these workshops, so nobody will uh, be just thrown into this, uh, where basically we show how the process works. And it's essentially, um, if you can hit back a couple of slides to that slide, um, Derek, that shows the, yes, that, no, sorry, the one of the covenants. It's essentially looking at documents like this um, and reading it carefully, finding the actual racially restricted covenant and then transcribing it, typing it. Um, and so um, that might not sound very fun or interesting, but in fact, uh, for those of us, again, we're, Lawrence said he was the nerd on the panel. I think it's safe to say that we're all pretty nerdy here um, because we find it extremely exciting to look at these documents. And it really is fascinating to see the different kind of language that appears in these racial covenants, what this tells about the racial fears and the racism at the time. Um, so it would be a simple matter of looking at these property records. And, um, and of course, we'll be, this is a collaborative thing. It would be with other people. We would be talking about the covenants. So it would be an engaged process. It wouldn't just be some, something where people are working in isolation. Thank you. But I, I think, and you can actually do it at home on your own if you want, right? and in person so if you know if, if you want to work there actually we hear from our colleagues in Minnesota that there are some people that have taken on this work as like a part-time job because they find it so interesting and so they'll be constantly working on you know working on identifying some of these deeds um, so you know if any of you are looking for you know you feel really excited about public records um, this is this is your project from the Five Points neighborhood in Milwaukee, they ask, what measures are Milwaukee County, city, 
implementing today to restructure this program of discriminatory practices using current funding instead of conversation without takeaways and implemented plans? You will. Okay, I don't know if anybody else has any additional comments, but Chairperson yeah, I think that'll be Nicholson. addressed in a minute, um, yeah. Okay, so Chairperson Nicholson will um, address that later on, thank you. Um, all right, I live in Waukesha County. Is there a similar project in that county? If not, how can we utilize what we've learned tonight to apply to other counties? The first thing to do, um, well, we'd love to connect with you. Um, and I'll just say that the project in uh, Minneapolis is now extended into Ramsey County, into St. Paul. Um, so it does make sense to go into, and it would certainly make sense to, to look into the Wow counties, Washington, Ozaki, and Wash Waukesha counties. Um, those counties have often been referred to as the iron ring around Milwaukee. And so we know that there would be probably a, a lot of covenants there. I think the first step would be um, to, to inquire about the property records and if they're digitized, um, because that would probably be the first thing that would need to happen. Um, and then, you know, we'd love to connect with you and we could talk with you more about the process itself. Yeah, and one other thing, there was a report written um, in the 1950s about the use of covenants in Waukesha, particularly as it related to violations of the, of the, you know, the, the decision the Supreme Court made that they were unenforceable. So this particular agency was looking at whether or not people were violating uh, that Supreme Court decision by continuing to write covenants. So we know that there were a significant number written out there, but just as Ann said, you, you really have to look at the records to find out, and nobody's really tried to do it. Okay. Thank you. Um, Marvel Rupel asks, um, how does redistricting of voting areas promote structural racism toward eliminating it? Uh, <laughs> I don't, I'm not quite understanding that question. I'm going to go on. Um, current building practices and allotment of contracts continue to perpetuate covenants. This is the same with taxes and resources that affect quality of life. What data and movement is prepared? Well, the part of, of what the, the, the national organization I mentioned earlier, the redress movement, part of uh, the task of the redress movement, they've launched it in Denver, Charlotte, and Milwaukee to begin with. Uh, and we have um, people that work for redress, they're all over the, the country. So we have people in New York, in Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Orlando, Charlotte, Denver, Milwaukee, Chicago. So the team at redress is, is attempting to come into the communities uh, like Milwaukee. Uh, we have three teams. We have the research team, we have the digital team, and then we have the on-ground team that will be working as community organizers. Uh, last week, uh, I was able to set up meetings with different community uh, leaders. So we set up a meeting with leaders of the African-American community that are interested in housing issues, uh, the Latinx community leaders that are interested in those issues, and then we met with some folks that work in the suburban and exurban communities that are interested in these issues. So part of what Redress wants to do is to begin to look in, in, in quite a bit of detail at who is responsible for creating these policies and practices. So looking at the banks that were responsible, looking at the real estate companies, the, the developers and all of those and saying, listen, you damaged people's uh, lived experiences, you're responsible to redress that in some way, shape or form. So kind of what Redress wants to do is to look in, in depth and then bring those three communities together and even a wider, you know, uh, uh, a wider uh, number of people in Metro Milwaukee to say, listen, we know that these are the problems that were created. We want to have some input in terms of what the fixes will be. I always say this about uh, fixing problems. Nobody knows the problems better than the people that are the victims of those problems. And, and so grassroots level stuff is where the real work is done with redress moving forward. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a part of that, redress is just starting with kind of flying the airplane and building the airplane at the same time because it's a brand new organization but we're excited about 
all of the people that I've talked to about redress, they're excited about being part of the solution-based process. We always talk about the problems, so redress is really about those solutions, and they take place on a variety of different levels with, with elected officials, with uh, policymakers in the public and private sector, uh, you know, and, and, and most importantly, the voices of people that are impacted. So it's gonna be a concerted effort by a lot of people it's not gonna be something that changes you know, the, the, the nature of things overnight, but it's something that will lead to the types of solutions, I believe, that the solutions aren't there because people haven't been engaged with people from other communities in terms of talking about these issues and challenges. And I believe very strongly that when you get a, a, a collective of people, you get the right people in the right place to have the right conversations, you begin to build processes, policies that lead to real real change, the types of changes that we're always sitting and waiting for somebody. We are in a process of saying, listen, we're not gonna sit around and wait for somebody else to fix it. We're gonna engage the community in working towards those fixes and holding people accountable, uh, creating a redress fund. Uh, so these organizations that have been responsible for creating these things create a redress fund, and then that fund will be used to fund those efforts to help mitigate some of the damage caused. But redress movement won't have the dollars, we won't, have, we won't control how the fund is used. We'll have an organization in each city that those dollars will go to and they will be the one that will be responsible for how those dollars are, are, are you know, used in that community. We don't want redress to say, you know, we, we have the money, if you want it, come and get, no, we don't want to do that. We don't want to be a part of that. We want to bring the money into the fund and let the community decide how those funds are gonna be used. Add, um, that we, we know that covenants is, are just one piece of this picture of, of, of racial segregation in the Milwaukee metropolitan region. Mm -hmm. And we know that these practices continue in different ways as the question points to, that these are ongoing dynamics. And so what we really help is, hope is that through this project mm -hmm. and then also through these conversations that we're having with one another, um, that this can prompt changes, <coughs> it can prompt action and, and potentially the development of new policies to really respond to, to the racial context and to the racial segregation and ongoing disinvestment um, in, in black communities in the region. And one last thing I wanna add about Redress. So what Redress is going to do is going to build committees in Milwaukee that will be the, the folks on the ground that are working to build the ideas, the process, the policies moving forward. They will be the ones that will decide how these funds are gonna be distributed. So they're gonna be local committees uh, in the communities here in Milwaukee that will be the decision makers. And Redress is here to help we're, we're here to engage people in the process and then say, okay, here you go. We've helped do what you do to find the solutions yourselves. I've got a couple of questions that are similar, so I'm gonna just read them both to you. Given the um, well-known segregation apparent throughout Milwaukee and the suburbs, how was the original sample randomized without bias? And then the other one is the 254 scan deeds randomly pulled from county, um, from county reads, I think, and were the results statistically significant or were the deeds picked from one municipality or area? from any municipality or area. They were just random deeds that were literally selected um, from each of these decades. So we were looking to see, can we identify um, the presence, presence of restrictive covenants in these various periods of time? And we did. And so there's no bias in this because we're just taking property records and running them through the OCR system to see if they, in fact, had racial language or not. If they contained racial language, then they were pulled. That's how the whole system works. It's not specifically targeting one community or another. It's looking at the whole of the property records in Milwaukee County. I would also add, and I meant to mention this when I was talking, um, but the, the, the percent hit rate is actually a little bit higher than the project in Minneapolis, and that was part of why we moved forward with the project is because uh, we anticipated having about on par or maybe even more hits than they had. And uh, our colleague at uh, 
at uh, mapping prejudice actually accredited that in part to the higher quality of the deeds that we have. In some ways, uh, statistical significance isn't really even that important in, in this situation because it's really just about are there deeds or aren't there. We, if there are any, we want to know where they are um, and we're, we're out to find them. So you're a mind reader because you just answered that question. <laughs> um, since the character software only flags racial language, how are you accounting for deeds that don't use racial language but are racist? The, the group at Mapping Prejudice actually, uh, they have a list of 150 similar words that are found in the covenants. So it's not necessarily just racial language. There are 150 different words that are, that are found in a lot of the covenants that they've discovered. So it's not just about racial language. Oftentimes the covenants, um, as, as Ann kind of mentioned earlier, uh, are you know, restrictions against people who aren't U.S. citizens either. Right? So you'll find a variety of different languages, and they're kind of boilerplate language that's used in the covenants, but they specifically said if one of these 150 words is in it, then we think that this is probably a covenant. So it's not just necessarily racial language. I just want to add on this, um, that uh, we, are, we are a group of researchers based here in Milwaukee, but this kind of work is happening across the United States right now. There's actually an upsurge of this kind of work. Um, there's a National Covenants Coalition where we share information. And Mapping Prejudice, the, the group in Minnesota, has worked with many other cities. And they're constantly updating their algorithms according to what they find in different locations. And so what the, the language that you see in deeds in racial covenants varies according to place because of the racial context of different places. For example, in the state of Washington, there's an extraordinary amount of covenants that target what are often called the Asiatic races, so Asian American citizens. Um, in Minneapolis, they find uh, a fairly extensive uh, number of covenants targeting indigenous Americans, so American Indians. Now, we don't know the full scope of what we'll find here in Milwaukee, but I'm just kind of wanting to mention this because they're constantly up late, updating their language um, based upon, we're learning as we go, and we've been doing this now uh, for quite some time in different locations, and so we're, we're able to, to flag all kinds of words, and so it might, it might not be words that are explicitly racial, but it might have more to do uh, with the, the prohibition, the citizen, uh, you know, the, the kind of these words that flag. Um, just to add, one of the words that I found interesting in the Milwaukee Covenants, as well as in Minneapolis, where um, only members of the Caucasian race can own and live in these properties, black people are allowed to be in these properties, but only as domestics. So domestic is one of these words that has been consistent um, in some of these covenants. Sorry, you can tell once we get started on some of this, we get really excited. And maybe I'm just speaking for myself here, but one of the interesting things too is that um, the covenants themselves tell us about how ideas about race and racism have changed over time. Um, so definitions of race are not static, and we know that you know when we look through history, as we see the way that different groups have been classified um, or racialized, as we say it in academia, um, and, and what we can see is a very interesting language used to refer to different groups. So, for example, in Shorewood, there's a couple of uh, covenants referring to Ethiopian populations. Um, commonly, uh, that Ethiopian, you know, that was used to refer to all black people. Um, we see different kind of language being used to refer to Jewish populations. Um, and so you see various uh, ethnicities and races being classified in various ways, which tells us a lot about um, how things have changed and what the racial thinking was at the time. And so that's one of the reasons I highlighted the citizen comment, because you know, this, is, this is very significant to the history of Milwaukee. So this one, I'll see if you can answer this. Um, one notice is the separation of land and house. Deeds used to include land in all its meanings and the house. Now it's different, and when did the change occur? I can't specifically answer the second part of that question about when that happened, but. At the, the period of, of our study, um, the covenants, the restrictive covenants, they run with the land. 
Um, so it's really, it's a, in fact, the fact that the, that the land component is really important. Uh, many developers often attached covenants to land before they or while they were subdividing it because it was just a lot easier to go ahead and covenant all, all of the parcels of land in a particular area as it was being platted and developed. Um, so um, that's an important distinction. I'd have to, I, I, and now I'm curious, and I will look into that when that, that happened, but in the period of our study where the, the land is the critical component, that these, the covenants are running with the land itself. So will your research and maps be publicly available once completed? What is your next step? Yeah, you're tired of hearing from me, so I'll, I pass it on. But um, yes, the whole goal of this project, um, you know, really I became inspired to do this work, connected with Reggie um, and with Lawrence, um, after years of teaching a class at UWM called the Geography of Race, where we spend a significant amount of time talking about racial segregation. Um, and I really wanted this to be something that was accessible in the classroom to students. I wanted uh, communities, uh, nonprofits, organizations who were trying to make sense of uh, what they were seeing in their own neighborhoods to be able to find out more about why their neighborhoods looked the way that they did. Um, and so I think all of us here are deeply committed, uh, I would say actually kind of an animating focus of this project is getting this information to the public and making this available. So yes, the maps will be featured on a website. Um, we'll, you know, they'll be available for everybody. Uh, the covenant data will be available. So so people can continue to look at them, to look at and to think about, do further research projects. Um, so yes, the goal of all of this is really just to take these, these racial covenants, where, which are embedded in property deeds that we don't see the light of day, to pull them out so that we can understand more about them and their continuing impact. And, and I, I think it's important for everybody here to understand very clearly the reason that we're doing this project, this we're doing it as a public service. No, we don't have to do this, right? I mean, this is really hard work. The people at University of Minnesota didn't have to do this because no one has really been able to, to, to do what they did, which is to find those covenants, map them, and really let people know how extensively they were used. And so part of what we're trying to do is we know there was a report in the late 70s that showed how the covenants were used in our suburbs, but we're like, well, what about the city? People need to know where they were in the city and even those suburbs where you know, this group went through paper records trying to find the stuff, they didn't have the resources we have available to us now. It makes no sense for us to do this work and to involve community members if it's not gonna be publicly available. This is who we're doing it for. We're doing it as a public service for all of the residents of Metro Milwaukee to kind of see this is how we got to where we are. This is why we had you know, all of these literally, literally by law, all white spaces created intentionally and people have been led to believe their entire lives that people self-segregate. Right? That people want to live around people like themselves, but the reality is, is that by using these covenants, white people had the power of the local, state, and federal government behind them saying, we can restrict who lives in these communities. We can not only restrict who lives in these communities, but just as Derek mentioned about the domestic workers, they put stipulations in some of the covenants saying that, okay, if you're a domestic worker, then you can occupy this space legally while you're working, but after your workday is done, you can't legally be here any longer. So we want people to understand how important that is, how that leads to what I mentioned earlier about disinvestment. You're literally disinvesting in an entire community of people that you're saying can't be in this community, cannot occupy these spaces. And it's important for those of us, whether we like it or not, this is the way things were. None of us are responsible for that. We're responsible for what we do with that information. Can you hear me? Okay, there we go. Um, the other component of this project too is we also want to collect the stories, you know, the family stories of housing segregation. You know, I shared the story of, of Zeddy Heiler. I'm quite sure there's other stories of, of people who are trying to buy a house or um, trying to rent property and being denied. Um, I was doing some archival research and I discovered in a historical uh, Shorewood newspaper uh, where Belle Phillips gave an interview when she um, talked about trying to buy a house on the east side and 
Um, they ain't even let her own the house, into the house. She, they stopped her at the sidewalk. So I want to hear, we, we want to capture these stories too. And, and, and some of these stories will also be available on, on, on the website um, to help put a broader picture to, to, the, to the maps. So do they still have crosses on the Wauwatosa street signs? If not, when were they taken off? answer maybe somebody here who is, is familiar with that or who lives in Wauwatosa might be able to give insights but that's not something I know about myself okay. uh, just a couple of more questions how do you plan to publicize this project to the mass of people that may not be as interested? And I'm gonna answer that a little bit first. Everybody in here, talk to five people who you think might not be interested and educate them. <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> This is, you know, this is going to be, this is going to involve a lot of us, us going out and talk, taking the show on the road, so to speak, um, and you know, engaging with communities. That's that's an, a critical part of it. So, um, visiting different communities and organizations, telling them about our work, telling them what's happening. So you'll be hearing a lot from us. There'll be lots of emails, um, but it is worthwhile noting that, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, this we're just one project within a broader ecosystem of other projects that are doing this. And so there are still a lot of people, for example, um, in, in the city of Minneapolis or St. Paul who participated there and who want to continue participating. And so people actually will be looking and, and be involved in doing this beyond Milwaukee. They'll be, you know, this, is, this has been um, introduced in, in Minneapolis in, in various ways to, in the classroom, um, in, as, so that as a way to learn about histories of segregation. Um, at the college level, students might be interested in seeing some of these. So we're, you know, we're really drawing on the kind of infrastructures that have been built over the past few years, but of course we'll be reaching out to as many organizations as possible to involve people Again, because this is a project that is about all of us, it's about the public, and it's about learning and producing these maps together. So I apologize, we're out of time for the Q&A. Um, so if your question did not get answered, I know that Anne had put up her um, email. You could possibly reach out that way. Um, one of the people on our committee um, for planning this evening is Eva Hagenhofer. And she is going to come up and um, read the resolution to repudiate discriminatory covenants. So um, you've already been asked to participate in this as uh, verifiers um, of the language in these deeds. So that's one ask. And the second ask is to get behind this resolution, um, taking it into your communities, um, and uh, the goal of which is to repudiate um, these resolutions. Um, before I get into that. Um, we just want to thank uh, Susan Labuddy, who's a parishioner here um, at Christ Church, uh, a member of the beloved community uh, team here at the church. And um, we're, we're, our thanks is because she was the principal author of this resolution um, and did an enormous amount of background work, um, which you can read. Um, uh, there's a, uh, in the resource list of, in your program, um, there's a link to it. So you can read this um, very thorough six-page document. So as we have all heard and learned tonight, thanks to the incredible research that we've been um, learning from, um, 
Discriminatory covenants have played an extensive role in pervasive racial segregation with historical and continuing impacts on property ownership, accumulation of wealth, property transfers, mortgage financing and rental eligibility, and property valuation and taxation in our communities and across the country. We now therefore explicitly repudiate these discriminatory covenants and call on Milwaukee County Board of Supervisors to do three things. One, acknowledge the harm discriminatory covenants cause to society in general and people of color in particular by their continuing presence in the real estate records maintained in the Milwaukee County Register of Deeds office and elsewhere. Two, urge all of its residents to recognize that discriminatory covenants are unenforceable, morally repugnant, against public policy and applicable law, and of no legal force or effect. And three, explicitly, <coughs> excuse me, and completely repudiate every discriminatory covenant contained in any deed, plat map, subdivision governing agreement and or bylaws, and any other real estate documents affecting property located in Milwaukee County, state of Wisconsin, and directs that these resolutions be recorded with the Office of the Register of Deeds of Milwaukee County in order to provide public notice thereof. So we urge all of you to call for the adoption of this or a similar resolution in Milwaukee County cities, towns, and villages. For anyone interested, as I mentioned before, in reading the full text of the resolution's preamble um, containing this very extensive background information, um, you can find the link there in, in the post-event resources. It is now my privilege to introduce Supervisor Marsalia Nichol Nicholson, um, who is an award-winning activist and the first black and Latina woman to be elected as chair of Milwaukee County Board of Supervisors. Prior to her election as board chair, she served as first vice chair and chair of the board's Economic and Community Development and Intergovernmental Relations Committee. Born and raised in Milwaukee, Chairwoman Nicholson attended Milwaukee Public Schools and was an honor graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Having grown up in Milwaukee's 53206 zip code community, she now works to make the opportunities she was given as a young woman available to others. She is a champion for working people, public education, economic development, and community empowerment. Her past work as a teacher, an MTEA union activist and community organizer, informs her policy and community work. She is the author of several significant pieces of legislation, including a $15 an hour living wage ordinance, an eviction reduction program, a resolution establishing Juneteenth Day as a major holiday, and a declaration stating that racism is a public health crisis. Please join me in warmly welcoming Chairwoman Nicholson, who will share her thoughts on this evening. So happy to be here. Hello. I, I'll hold the mic because I also did not wear the right top for here. But um, can we give our panelists and organizers of this event a round of applause? Um, thank you, Bay Bridge, for this opportunity to, to be here and provide these closing remarks. And thank all of you for this enlightening discussion. I myself learned so much, so hopefully you all took some value from it as well. Um, so my, my remarks are as follows. Um, in 2019, I helped lead the charge to declare racism a public health crisis in Milwaukee County, making us the first local government in the nation to do so. Since that time, hundreds of other cities and counties have followed our lead. By making this declaration, we shed light on what we knew to be true, that racism affects nearly every aspect of our lives, from what we learn and don't learn in our schools to how medical treatments and social services are administered. But one area we found that racism is especially pervasive in is determining where we all live. I think we all now know the data showing that Milwaukee has the unfortunate distinction 
of being one of the most segregated cities in the nation, with many disparities affecting communities of color, causing us also to be named the worst place to raise a black child. As mentioned, I grew up in 53206. Um, in fact, I grew up in subpar housing. I'm so glad, uh, Reggie, that you showed that picture on 27th and Burleigh. I grew up on 12th and Burleigh. And um, bad plumbing, so we would boil water for baths. It was, we had bad electrical, so we would use that same gas stove to heat our home in the winter. And the only thing that set me apart from a white child growing up in a nice home in Shorewood is that my mom and dad were born of color and poor, and that I was born of color and poor. And that's the reality for many children throughout Milwaukee County every day. As we continue to work towards our vision of achieving racial equity and becoming the healthiest county in Wisconsin, I am proud of the work that Milwaukee County has done to try and reverse the damage done by racist housing policies, such as the restrictive covenants we just learned about today. One way we do this is by helping expand access to affordable housing throughout Milwaukee County. So now I can't answer that question that was asked around, what are we doing? So very recently, and I think Supervisor Martin is still here, she helped spearhead this effort as chair of ECD, uh, we approved a WEDIC grant, uh, $250,000 for the Community Within the Corridor Project, which is in my district. This project is a mixed use development at 32nd and Center Street, and it will include more than 180 units of affordable housing along with commercial and community use. This is that former factory that was left empty. It's now being turned into this project. And this is all happening within an area that has historically been under developed and underinvested in. Um, another important thing I wanted to mention is in, in keeping with Reggie's remarks, who I, I just love you so much, you're amazing. Um, but we all can do something about this because that project is not spearheaded by some major well-resourced development firm. Um, it was for young black and brown men and women who are in the same age group as myself who grew up in communities next to mine. Um, they're spearheading that project. Um, and that's a role that we can continue to take as policymakers to uh, play a role in this as well. Uh, Milwaukee County, we also use our seat on what are called joint review boards for local tax incremental districts to push communities, often in the same suburbs, for years that had those restrictive covenants to support affordable housing initiatives. I think you all might remember about one year ago, uh, the village of Shorewood invested about $2.5 million into affordable housing using this process, and I'm proud that Milwaukee County, specifically the Office of Equity, formerly Office on African American Affairs, uh, lent support to that effort. Um, another thing that Milwaukee County and the city of Milwaukee are a part of is what is called the Community Development Alliance uh, Plan, which is a new plan uh, with the goal of uh, supporting 32,000 new black and Latino homeowners um, and building or improving 10,000 additional affordable homes and they'll do this through counseling, through alternative lending, um, through uh, uh, foreclosure mitigation, um, and um, other things. And you can learn more about that plan at housingplan.org. Policy choices such as these open the door for people of color who were explicitly prevented from purchasing a home in Shorewood at one time to find a place to live in that community if they choose to. So it is my hope that uh, the elected officials and community members in this room, in our suburbs particularly, uh, and especially the ones who enacted these such covenants, can continue to find every tool they have available to open their communities up to those who have been historically shut out. I also want to thank the event organizers for taking the step of drafting a resolution that repudiates racially restrictive covenants across Wisconsin. It is my understanding that uh, Supervisor Sheldon Wasserman will be introducing a version of this resolution to the County Board of Supervisors. And I um, encourage all of you, once that is introduced, to reach out um, to the board and let them know that you support uh, this resolution. While we continue to make progress, we still have a long way to go. When it comes to achieving equity in housing, there are still far too many black and brown people who are forced into insufficient housing due to policy choices. I hope that we take the information that we all learned tonight to continue to push for changes that will bring about equity in housing so that every man, woman, and child, regardless of what they look like, where they come from, or the money they have in their wallet, can have a safe home that they can be proud to call home. So thank you for being here, um, and thank you so much for your willingness to be a part of these efforts. I really appreciate you.
Thank you so much, Chairwoman Nicholson. That was wonderful to hear. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you to the tremendous panel. Um, for follow-up, please check your inboxes. We're going to send you a list of resources that was referenced here tonight that also includes the resolution, and it's not just for the county or municipalities. It is also for non-governmental organizations to adopt should they choose. And we have initially circulated it um, sort of on a smaller basis, and it has already been adopted by Cream City Conservation Corps, um, of course, Bay Bridge, the Racial Diversity Team of the United Methodist Church of Whitefish Bay, Divided by Design, Grassroots North Shore, and Five Points Neighborhood Association. So if you're affiliated with a non-governmental organization as well, you can email us at baybridgewisconsin at gmail.com and we will provide you with some of that language and you can of course adopt it to your own organization. Um, the sign up for helping with the mapping project is over on that table, so please take advantage of that. And if you haven't um, given us your email yet and would like to receive the resources um, after this event, which includes um, some podcasts that will give you more information on this issue, um, as well as articles um, that have run in the New York Times and the Washington Post and things on PBS, um, several additional learning opportunities. And then we also invite you to some upcoming Bay Bridge events. Voices of Milwaukee Bronzeville is a new book by Dr. Sandra Jones, and this event will be co-sponsored by Hummingbird and Five Points Neighborhood Association um, with author Dr. Sandra Jones. And Mr. Samuel Sins and Ms. Sharon Adams will be there um, being interviewed as well. That's at the Whitefish Bay Public Library on Thursday, May 19th, 6.30 p.m. Uh, we will also be uh, partnering with United Methodist Church for Unconscious Bias with Judge Derek Mosley on June 15th. Um, and all of these have streaming as well as in-person um, options. Next week, we are doing a screening of Messwood with Milwaukee Film as part of the film festival on Tuesday, May 3rd at the Times Cinema. And then on Wednesday, May 4th, we are doing an athletic shoe collection with Jakari Kicks for Kids where we are collecting athletic shoes for men, women, boys and girls, and you can bring those to Schoolhouse Park across from the Whitefish Bay Public Library between 9 and 10 a.m. But again, this will be in a follow-up email to you, um, baybridgewisconsin at gmail.com to ask any further questions. And again, thank you so much, panelists, and the amazing project that you're doing for our community. And oh, and we have a quick survey for you to take right now. If you go... Uh, take your phones out and go to menti.com, www.menti.com. Are you there? <laughs> and once you are there, here is the code. Menti is M-E-N-T-I. And the code you will use is 36145196. I can repeat that. 36145196. And there you can take our post event survey. Sure. And the code is the winning lotto number is 36145196. Three, I guess we should have made that into a slide. <laughs> oh, okay. The virtual people are on it. Okay. Thank you so much. And again, don't forget to sign up for the Mapping Racism and Resistance Research Project over there and your email uh, downstairs. And thank you so much for being here.